absolutely no correlation at all. So that's good to see because it means that when you write final exams and you do have a time constraint, it's not the time constraint that makes your grade lower. The grade is lower if you don't need the material, not due to the time. So other things about the textbook, that was just more for my interest to see the breakdown of the old version versus the new version. Uh, things that people like about the course, they like the examples, the video, the reviews, the fine material, and so forth. Let's talk about the next part, which is the most important part of the feedback from my side. Most of you wanted to see more examples in the class. So let's do that. So we will we'll have some more examples coming up in the class. I thought, um, in general, I have a fair number of examples. Um, in fact, people do recognize that the top thing that people liked about the course was the examples. But also the top complaint that people liked about or wanted to see improved is more examples. So we'll have, have a few more examples coming up. People wanted a bit more time for the assignments. So the only reason why I have the assignments due on Thursday is so that I can collect them here in class. But I have no problem making them on Friday at the Dropbox. So let's do that in the future. You can hand in on Fridays at the Dropbox for the assignments, but you can also easily hand in Thursday nights at this class. If you feel you need a few extra hours to hand in on Friday at the Dropbox, go for it. Um, people wanted to see previous tests and exams. This is the first time I'm teaching this course, so I don't have previous tests and exams. I can post, however, the last final exam if that's of any interest to you, um, but it's not my style at all. So it, take it for what it's worth. It would be like just doing extra problems at the back of phone, it's just more practice for yourself, but it's not my style. If that's what you're looking for for final uh, for practice questions, um, please go ahead and use Folder, please go ahead and, and uh, do the final exam. I'll post the last year's final exam to the website. People wanted to see then, there was a variety of other things. Uh, they wanted to see a few more review lectures, they wanted me to use the textbook a bit more, and for me to suggest problems from Fodler, so I'll do that on the course website. Every week I will post some problems that you could go ahead and do yourself. I would have assumed um, most of you seem to have bought the textbook, only one person indicated they did not have the textbook. So I, was, I would have assumed that most of you automatically would be doing problems from the back of Fodler anyway without me prompting you, but I can certainly tell you some problems that I would suggest you to look at. And um, as I've mentioned before, the solutions manual seems to be available online. Um, people want to develop their own software, feel free, absolutely. Uh, if that's something you wanted to do in your own time, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, people wanted to see more marks in the midterm. I don't think that is something that you did want to see, really. Um, I, to me, 60 marks was pretty much uh, a reasonable representation of what the midterm should be. The final exam will probably be a good box. Uh, one comment on the bad classroom. I know T13 is always always a bad location. Um, that's a consistent problem. However, um, that is only something you can change. I complain to the university they will not listen to professors. They will listen to the people that pay tuition. So if you do not like your classes, you must complain and should complain. For that dollar figure you're paying a year, you deserve better than this. Um, but unfortunately, I cannot, I cannot do anything about it. And I've tried before, but uh, nothing, nothing happens. Uh, one person commented that the videos make it too lenient for people that don't come to class. The purpose of the videos is not for leniency or for forcing you to come to class. The purpose of the videos is so that you can go home and review the material if, you, if you're here at the class. A number of you have told me that the way you use the videos is that you sit in class and you pay attention to what I do, and then you go home and watch it a second time and take notes from the videos. I think that's an excellent strategy. So you're using the video purely for review, not... If you miss class, you miss class for whatever reason, uh, and you catch up, and that's also good. But the purpose of the video is not uh, give some people an easier ride also at all. It's, you still need to do the work to, to do well in this course. Um, other than that, was there any other feedback or comments that you wanted to make? So I think those those changes to the course are pretty reasonable. Uh, longer time for assignments. I'll, I'll do more examples in class. I'll post last year's final exam. And on a few of those points, there were some things that I can easily make changes to. That we so the next five six weeks or so, I'll be sure to see those changes. 
why not have two midterms? Uh, two midterms would require the first one to be earlier and the next one coming up. I don't think the second midterm is going to benefit you any more than having the frequent number of assignments and projects. Remember, if you have a second midterm, it's going to be at the same time as your project is due. The last thing I want you to load up is this is no work. Okay, what's up with the project? So let's talk about the project. The project, I was, hoping, I was hoping to to work on an outline over this weekend. I just ran out of a bit of time. Um, I had some other references and things to write. So what I will do is I'll post it in the next day or two. The project is going to be fairly straightforward. It will be groups. You can work with partners on it. Uh, it's a purely electronic document that you submit, so you must submit electronically. You'll submit your, your report on a, probably a plug flow reactor that you designed. It will be packed bed, it will be non-isothermal, there will be multiple reactions, and there will obviously be pressure drops. So it will be a numerical, a numerical solution in the form of polymath, Python, or MATLAB. That's why we spent so much time in the previous classes on that topic and going through that in that on the board, interactive video, in class, and in tutorials. So that will be the nature of the project. It will be probably a gas-based system, so there will be expansion and contraction as you go along the reactor. Um, so the details of that I'll post. The report's length will be about 15 pages, and most of the grades will be on clarity of presentation, like how you follow a systematic procedure to design the reactor. So details will be this week. And we'll be due at the end of the month. Anything else? Okay, so let's uh, let's take a review quick of last class. And last class we got to coincidentally an example. So just in time to uh, basic feedback, we've got an example guys. <laughs> Um, I have decided. Would you decide the group? No. So this is the example in the tutorial, in the tutorial I will do today or tomorrow, or uh, well, that you worked on today and tomorrow. So it's a batch reactor, so it's not a steady state. And because it's not a steady state, we have time dependent data. So at that certain time of the minutes, we measure the concentration CA. Okay, hey, just a second here, everyone. Let's pay attention to what's going on. This is in the tutorial. Uh, so so some of you in the class have seen this today. Um, the other part of them will work on this tomorrow. Over time, we measure the following concentrations. So it's 0, 50, 100, 150, 200, and 250. And actually, I'm rewriting what's up here in the, in the cell spreadsheet, which we're going to work through it in the cell. Concentration, we measure the at time 0, at time 50 we measure 114, at time 100 we measure 87, 76, 70, and 58. So we took this down last class, you may have this in the notes when you the time, or it's up here on the projector, or if you've got a tutorial uh, from this week, please start in front of you, it's also in there. Okay, so from this morning's tutorial, any group um, figure out what type of reaction this is? First order, second order, zero to order. Second. First order. Third order. Okay. <laughs> so let's take a look. What's the systematic approach that we follow for these types of problems? The first thing we should do. 
kind of fun. Okay. So what, what are we aiming to do here? What's, what do we know? What do we don't know? And let's draw a picture. So we've got to, let's take a look at this defining step. So we follow this systematic procedure we're defining. We define what we know, what we don't know. And one thing to draw is a picture of the system. So it's a batch reactor. We're placing our material A in here, and it's going to go to products. And we're measuring the concentration of A over time, so we've got T versus C A A. Coming from a batch reactor. The batch reactor we said in an earlier class and we looked at it as well is perfect for this because we get our full set of data on time and concentration in one single experiment. So we know here, I guess we write our time and CA data. What don't we know? So the order of the reaction and the constant of the reaction. Or in other words, minus RA is equal to what is equal to. That's what we're aiming to understand. So if we plan our strategy here, we put on the rule last time, the strategy to follow. And one of the very first steps we said was to guess minus RA. So I wrote that on the board last time, guess minus RA, but let's be a little bit more complete here. The first step is guess minus RA is equal to, in other words, we're guessing the structure or the form of this equation. So it's a bit more, more than just saying guess minus RA, we're guessing the structure or the, the equation format. Now I will add an extra step zero here that I should have put on last time. And that is to plot T versus CA. <coughs> One of the first things you should always do is to plot your data. So we'll, we'll be more clear on this in the future classes. Here I've shown the concentration versus time. So up in the slide here in the front, we see concentration against time. Anything that, that we know in that plot. It's not a straight line, it's important, okay? It's not a horizontal line either, so our concentration is dropping. So that's good to see, concentration is dropping. First, <coughs> secondly, it's not dropping linearly. It's dropping at this exponentially declining rate. So from, that, from those observations, we can quickly rule out that this is definitely not a zero order reaction. Zero order reactions would have what shape? Straight line, horizontal, decreasing. Straight line decreasing would be a zero order reaction. So zero order does not mean nothing happens. Zero order would just have the state of line in a, in a decreasing slope. It means that the concentration is decreasing, but it's independent of the concentration itself. Here, concentration is decreasing as a function of its own concentration. So it's definitely first order or second order or something that's not, not zero order. So we can rule out that. Coming back to our plan, the, the rest of the strategy was then, after we guessed minus RA, was we sub in into our batch ODE and we integrate. Let's just quickly recap what that means. Our batch ODE is DCA by DT is equal to RA. So if we guessed an RA structure, we would substitute that in over here on the right hand side and integrate this ODE. Step three then is to plot the integrated term. We'll call this y against time t. And that's my x.
and I'll just continue up here. Step four was check linearity. And step five was repeat if not linear. So there's my plan for this for attacking these types of problems. So we plotted our data. Let's assume it's first order and take a look at what we would get here in this instance. So let's guess first order and follow the rest of the plan. last time, so we'll simply write the result that last time we showed that the integration would give you the log of the initial concentration of the CA is equal to KA times T. So in step three now of our plan, where we're trying to plot the integrated term against time, what I mean by that is that our integrated term here is this log of the ratio of concentrations. So we're going to plot log of CA naught over CA. That's going to be my Y against time T as my X. So in Excel or MATLAB, we would do that calculation. What CA naught do we get? <coughs> Yep, we know CA naught. This is a batch reactor. It's the initial concentration at time zero in my batch. So here's my picture of the batch reactor. I charged material A to the batch at the initial time zero. I have up here 154 moles per liter of CA. So that's my CA naught. It's given for me in the table. So if I calculate log of CA naught over CA, as you can see, my formula that I've just done, 154 over V2. 3, 4, 5, and so sort of that part. So let's plot that then. That's this plot over here, given by the green points, and I've added the trend line already, so I've kind of preempted myself. Let me just turn that off a bit. Okay, so there's the plot of log CA over CA naught against time t. Linear or not linear? So let's move to step four of my, my plan. Check if this is linear. <coughs> Okay, so the question here is, would you use R squared to check if it's linear? Any other thoughts on the linearity or the structure that you see in that plot? It's close. Okay, so a lot of it comes down to what do we mean by check linearity over here? How do we judge whether it's linear? Any other thoughts on how we might do that so far? Our k value will be our slope in this case. That's right. Is that your question, or is it? No, no. It's like, you're just making that So yeah, the, the cell can give you the equation for sure. Yeah. So I, what I'm just looking at is. Let's just check if this is linear first. We're, we're definitely going, our slope is going to be our, our KA value, absolutely. Here you go. Uh, I mean, if, if we have a uh, so if we just calculate the CA and the plot TA and see how much that creates. So let me try to understand the strategy. You're going to help, you're going to get a couple of different things. So I'll calculate the KA but the K is the slope, and the slope is 
slope is a value based on all the data points. Yeah, but it should be covered. Okay, fine. So then when you get that slope, do you want to calculate more of the slopes? I'm saying that you can see that it's in like the middle of the square value of zero to five. Okay. Going is the next the next way we're going to try and solve this problem. Oh, okay, okay. Right. Uh, why don't you just try and plot the second order and see which one's better? Okay, so the uh, observation yeah. is why don't I plot the second order and see what is better? Let's uh, let's take a look at that. That is a that's a good suggestion. What do we mean by it's better? More linear. More linear. How are we going to judge linearity? Three R squared. Okay, four. No, I'm just going to say the value of Okay, R squared closer to one. So better in this case means more linear. More linear means the R squared value closer to one. Okay, this is the only class that I will let you say R squared is a good metric to use. When I teach you statistics, you'll learn a proper way to judge models. R squared is excellent choice in this case because the only thing R squared does is it checks the linearity between an X variable and a Y variable. R squared does not tell you how good a model is. So you've learned that in other courses, it's rubbish. R squared, the only thing R squared does is it tells you the degree of linearity between an X variable and a Y variable. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this case. And so R squared is the perfect tool to use. So we're going to go add the R squared line to this plot. We go most commonly, uh, you can add trend line. Choose linear. Anything else I should do? Okay. Interested in the equation? <coughs> should I set the intercept to zero? Okay, let's not set the intercept to zero and see what happens. So if the intercept is non zero, it says that my slope is 0 0.0037, the KA value, plus is 0.0942. What is that 0.942? 0.0942. Okay, what does the intercept mean in this case? Okay, <laughs> so no, you're right, that's fine, that's absolutely right. Let me rephrase my question. What does the intercept mean physically in this particular instance? <laughs> Initial concentration where? <laughs> Let's take a look at this equation. Is there an intercept? Yes, there is. <laughs> Absolutely there is an intercept. There's always an intercept. It is plus zero. So you must set the intercept to zero in this instance. So for that trend like, so notice R squared is 0.95. You're going to be concerned here that if you set the intercept, the R squared drops to 0.92. But that is what you have to do. And notice your slope coefficient is a different number now. Your slope coefficient was not 0 0.0042 earlier. The slope coefficient is now 0 0.0042. That is a more accurate reflection of the slope, which is in this case referring to the A. What is a good R squared value? What is a good R squared value? Okay. One. One? No, but like 0.99. It doesn't matter. It absolutely does not matter because all we're doing, remember we said we're trying to find the best model, we're comparing. So we simply pick the one with the highest R squared. And so R squared numerical value does, net, does not and should not ever matter. So when we come to statistics in 4C, I'll show you models with R squares of 0.2, and those are beautiful models that you learn a lot from. I'll show you a model with R squared 0.9996, and it's a garbage model. Okay, so R squared is not going to be a number that you look at. All you're simply going to do is rank your R squares and pick the model that gets you the highest one. And so let's be clear on, on what R squares do. Uh, or 
But R squared, R squared here, you, you do need to force the intercept to zero. Okay, this is telling you what the R squared value is for this model with Y is equal to 0 0.0042x plus zero. So there is an intercept, it just happens to be zero. So you must you must force the intercept to be zero in this case, and then that's your corresponding R squared to 0.9285. So let's just take a note of this, this uh, here. So for alpha equals one, Ka is equal to 0 0.0042. What are the units of Ka? No, Ka, one over time, one over time one over which is minutes to the minus one. And R squared is 0.9285. Okay, so that's that model. Let's try a second order model point with alpha 2. So if we follow the same procedures we did last time, we guess minus RA, minus RA is KCA squared. Let's, uh, let's just modify what we have up here. So for the second order, minus RA is KCA squared. this last class, but if we integrate, we get 1 over CA is 1 over CA naught plus KAT. So we would plot that as my Y variable and plot 1 over CA against time. We always plot against time as my X variable. Again, with this sort of model, my slope is going to be equal to the other. Okay. Okay. Since we have it, this is how we should force it to one of the squares. The problem you'll find is that Excel will not do that for you. Okay, in that, that's the only place in Excel that you can do it. If you use the data analysis to add in, so if you go to tools, um, to tools data analysis, and you use the regression add in, um, this, this guy will only allow you to set the constant equal to zero. So, good observation. We need to force our intercept to be. We need to force our intercept to be one over C A minus. So let's uh, let's go do that down here. If I go plot my data, I'm plotting one over C A against time. Let's just take this. So that's a plot of one over C A on my y axis against time on my x axis. I haven't labeled these just because on my virtual machine I'm just really struggling to get my mouse working. Yeah, probably. Typically, you label that. So, let's go add the trend line. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So is this a first or second order model between these two? R squared here in the second instance is higher. R squared being a good judge of linearity is pointing out that this is a second order model. Let's just uh, point out one other thing. Here in this, in this particular trend line, we're seeing our residuals are scattered above and below the trend line. So we're getting what we say, there's no structure in the residuals. There's a random distribution of the residuals above and below the trend line. If we go look at this first instance up here, there is a structure in those residuals. These residuals down here at the early time points are above my regression line, and then at later time points are below the regression line. So there is structure in the residuals. So our residuals we expect to be more uh, randomly distributed above and below, and we're going to see that. In the second plot, we do see that. That is another indication to me that we've chosen a better order for this particular. Okay, any questions on that, that procedure? Standard, standard approach that will follow for all the three questions in the tutorial. I did just want to quickly talk about uh, one other function in R that uh, you don't always have to use trend lines to do this. Um, in R you have this built-in function called linest. So you can say linest and you give it a vector of y. So let's take that uh, as an example, a vector of y and then a vector of x. And that's it. It gives you the slope coefficient. Now, in this particular instance, the slope does not quite agree with the, the four that we had down here, only because this lin s function, you cannot force the intercept to be a certain value. Lin s can only fit a model with a slope and an intercept. You can't force the intercept to be a particular value. Except zero. You can only force the nice. Only if I, there is a, it does accept a third input, I can put in commas, comma true here, and that will force the intercept to be zero. I'm sorry, I false. That will force the intercept to be zero. But that's not what I want to do. I want to force the intercept to be one of the zero. Uh, it doesn't accept it. So unfortunately, when you're forcing the intercept to be a specific value, the only way you can use Excel is by using a trade line function. So just, uh, just be aware of that. Okay, so there was a new topic I wanted to introduce. It will take a little bit more than the 10 minutes we have remaining. But I thought to rather go slow on this, first because it's a good example, and secondly because it, it pulls out a number of factors that you may not be aware of. So interpretation of R squared and some of these statistical concepts uh, that you, you would have or should have learned in 3E or um, prior courses. So before I move on from here, let me just make sure that there's no, no further questions on how to fit these models and also how to interpret them. So what we're going to go Okay, what happens if there's K, C, A, C, D? In the tutorial question three, there's an example on that, and the tutorial question guides are all that. So while we're on that, we can just quickly talk about it. If you've got the right hand side, the left hand side of your your chemistry equation has multiple species. The typical approach is to use what's called the method of excess. So this is in the course textbook, uh, but it's also in the tutorial. The method of excess is used when you've got, for example, A plus 2B on the products. And let's say you assume minus RA is some constant KA, CA to the alpha, CB to the beta. So I'm following my plan here that I guess my rate expression. There's one problem though. The moment I try to substitute that into my batch equation, dCA by dt is equal to Ra, which is Ka 
minus kkca to the alpha ce to the beta. This is a differential equation for ca to the alpha ce to the beta. Unfortunately, cb is also varying. Cb is going to vary in proportion. Uh, it's going to every mole of a reacting is going to react in mole of b. So this is a messy equation to integrate. So what we do is we take a bit of a shortcut and we simplify our lives for ourselves by using what's called the method of excess, where we add b in excess to my batch reactor. So in my batch, if I want to visualize it, I'll add a little bit of a and then I'll add a lot of b, b added in excess. I add so much B that pretty much for the whole duration of the batch, the concentration of B remains constant. So CB is added in excess so that we can say CB is approximately equal to CB0. It remains constant for the duration of the batch. condition is met, which it does, is because we're, we're, we're forcing it to be met by adding so much excess B, then my rate expression simplifies to minus RA This again is an easy problem. <coughs> and from that we'll get beta and the KA that we we'll So we figured out two of the three constants. We needed originally, if we go back here, we needed KA. We needed alpha and we needed beta. So we've figured out what alpha and beta are from these two individual experiments. We still haven't figured out what the A is. Any guesses? I would like you to guess. So you plan 
time to use one of these equations here. So we know Ka dash, we know beta, we know C is zero, we solve for Ka. Or back here, we use that equation over there to solve for Ka. We will get different values. Which one do you pick? The average. Another strategy is the following, is to say, let me go back to any one of my experiments. So remember when I did my experiments, I collected T. Let's take, for example, my first experiment where I collected data of T versus CA, and then I had CB0 was known. So I collected these data. And I used those data, remember, to calculate, um, I used it to calculate alpha and Ka dash. What I can also do is I can augment this table with an extra column, with the column of minus Ra. So let's just go back here. Minus Ra was equal to Ka dash Ca to the alpha. Once I know alpha and I know Ka dash, I've got Ca values in my table and I can go calculate minus Ra at every instance of time. So minus Ra is Ka dash Ca to the alpha. So I can go add these columns over here. Yeah. So if I know minus Ra, I know Ca, I know alpha, I know CB, I know beta, I can back calculate for KA. So I can back calculate actually, let's add another column, KA here. I can back calculate for different values of KA. So here I get another five different KA values. Okay. Take the average of those again. So the problem is with the method of access, sure, we've made things easier for ourselves, but we have to remember at the end that what we've done is only approximate those rate constants. We're going to get different KA values here. I can get one KA value for every row in my data table. I, again, I have to average them. But they all should agree roughly with each other. So next class, we will just take up one final topic in this theme, and then we'll move on to the next chapter.